Good evening. My name is Dr. Karen Wright. I am the Director of Admissions and Program Evaluation for the George Washington Physician Assistant uh, Program. And I welcome you this evening for joining us in our first official uh, information webinar. Uh, typically, we hold four information sessions at, G at the GW campus throughout the academic year, uh, which allow participants to um, come to the Foggy Bottom campus and learn about the program and ask pertinent questions. But we thought it would be beneficial to offer a forum in the form of a webinar to provide those interested in PA with the opportunity, and, and those that can't actually attend the um, campus sessions, an opportunity to um, learn more about the GWPA program and uh, about the and application process. Today I am joined by Erin McCann, our Senior Academic Advisor for the program, as well as two of our current students um, who officially successfully completed their first semester in the physician system. Yay! <laughs> my student to, the, to my right is Ms. Celine Cronkite, who serves as the co-president of the James K. Tolton Society, um, which is the George Washington University Student Society chapter of the American Academy of Physician Assistants. Um, in addition, Ms. Cronkite is a dual, what we call a dueler. She is in the MSHS MPH program. And we're also joined by Mr. Daniel Brown, who currently serves on our student admissions uh, committee. We thought it would be beneficial to you if we had students available to, to respond to any questions that you might have so that you could get their perspective since they're living the life of a PA student now. Erin, at this time, will discuss the format and any of the logistics with regard to the webinar, and then I will start the uh, presentation on the, by providing you an overview of the profession and the program. Good evening, everyone. Um, just so you know, all of your mics and cams for viewers will be turned off. So we will not be able to see you and we will not be able to hear you. The way we will communicate from this point on is through your chat box. So you want to make sure that you can type in your chat box for any type of question. Uh, if you have any questions, we'd like for you to wait until the presentation is completed. That way we can make sure that we answer everyone's question and we don't miss anything. Um, if you have any questions, if you can't hear us, or there's something uh, wrong with your um, video, you want to go to the top to go to your tools, and then go to your video audio wizard to make sure that you can see and hear us. Um, if you cannot, sorry, we will begin the presentation. Um, if again, if you can't hear us or see us, go to your audio wizard, and if you still can't hear or see us, please type in the chat box, and we'll see if we can help you as soon as possible. Okay, thank you. Okay, so established in 1972, the George Washington U University Physician Assistant Program is one of the oldest in the nation and is rich in tradition. The program's location in the nation's capital um, provides our students with, a unique, uh, with unique opportunities, uh, both academic and clinical, as well as exposure to diverse patient uh, populations. Our program was one of the first to be sponsored by medical schools and continues to be housed in the School of Medicine and Health Sciences today. We are strongly committed to the vision and mission of our program and are looking for applicants who share these values. We envision our program to be a leader in PA education and believe our educational opportunities result in transformative experiences that inspire our students, our faculty, and alumni to become leaders committed to health for all individuals. We have an amazing faculty we, who collectively have over 150 years of PA education experience and 200 years in clinical practice. We are known leaders in the field, have served on various boards in PA education, in the uh, profession and other organizations and have even been recognized for our teaching. The George Washington University program has been continuously accredited by the Accreditation Review Commission since its establishment in 1972. And we are proud to say that we have graduated nearly 2,000 alumni and are looking forward to adding others to these ranks. To become a certified PA, 
Graduates must pass the Physician Assistant National Certifying Exam, otherwise known as PANT. Over the past five years, 97% of our students have passed the exam on their first attempt. Our most recent cohort, which graduated in May of 2014, are either, have either completed the exam or are scheduled to take the exam. And once we have the final passage rates, we will make those available um, on our website as well as the national pass rates for all programs, first time takers across the nation. So now I'm going to provide you with a, a brief overview of the, pre of the profession. I know some of you are, are just beginning to learn about the PA profession. Others may have solidified their um, reasons for wanting to pursue this profession. So I'm just going to provide a brief overview of what PAs are and what we do. <clears throat> physician assistants are healthcare providers who work with a supervising physician. They are nationally certified and licensed by their state and practice in various uh, clinical settings. They are, um, they are responsible for their duty base and encompass many tasks, including but not limited to taking medical histories, performing physical exams, ordering and interpreting diagnostic uh, studies, diagnosing illnesses, developing and implementing treatment plans, including prescribing medications. And currently, PAs are authorized to prescribe medications in 50 states, the District of Columbia, and all U.S. territories with the exception of Puerto Rico. PAs are an integral part of the healthcare system and, a, and an integral part of the healthcare team. The PA profession was founded in 1965 by Dr. Eugene Stead, the Chair and Professor of, of Medicine at Duke University. The first PA program at Duke accepted four Navy medical corpsmen in a two-year intensive medical program. And shortly thereafter, similar programs opened up in other medical centers, including our program here at George Washington University. Since 1965, the profession has grown substantially, and currently over 90,000 PAs are actively practicing um, in the United States. PAs are employed virtually in every type of practice setting in the healthcare system. They are working in single and multiple specialty group practices, solo private um, practices, hospitals, emergency departments, urgent care centers, um, they are working in rural health clinics, community health centers, they are employed by the U.S. Armed Forces and the VA health system, um, and in addition they are working in industrial and occupational health systems as well. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, employment of PA is expected to grow 38% from 2012 to 2022 much faster than the average for all occupations. And why do you ask? Well, the reasons are multifactorial. First, there's an increased demand for healthcare services. We have a brain of our society, so our, our population is aging. There's widespread prevalence of chronic diseases. And all of these factors combine with the fact that there's a shortage of physicians. PAs practice in nearly every specialty, medical specialty, and subspecialty. This chart shows the, me the mean annual income for PAs by specialty in 2013, based on data collected from the annual um, survey conducted by the American Academy of Physician Assistants. The mean salary across all practice settings Specialties and years in practice in 2013 was $97,000. Other interesting facts that you might be, uh, want to know is that approximately 65% of practicing the PAs are women, and the mean age is 42 years. So to talk a little bit more about our program, the study that we offer here, in order to sit for the entry level exam into the profession, again we spoke earlier about that, that is the Physician Assistant National Certifying Exam, 
you must graduate from an accredited PA program. At the time of this presentation, there are currently 187 accredited PA programs in the United States. Most programs range in length between 24 and 36 months and are composed of a didactic and a clinical um, com uh, component. And the average length of programs based on um, the data from 2011 and 2012 was 26 months. The GWPA program offers two degree programs, a two-year program leading to a Master of Science in Health Science and a three-year program leading to a dual degree in including a Master of Science in Health Science and a Master of Public Health. <clears throat> the traditional two-year PA program, which confers the degree of Master of Science in Health Science, includes one year of didactic or classroom study and one year of clinical practice, uh, clinical practicum experience. I'm going to briefly give you an overview of the academic curriculum, but I must inform you at this time that we are in the process of redesigning our didactic curriculum. And while the course numbers and titles and even maybe the course sequencing may change, the content will remain the same. In the first 12 months that you study in the program, you will be engaged in basic, by, um, basic sciences, behavioral, as well as clinical sciences. During your first semester, which starts in the summer, you will take several foundational science courses, including anatomy and biochemistry, as well as foundations of evidence-based practice, which focuses on research methods and statistics. You will also take a course entitled The Role of PA in the American Healthcare System, which is taught by a nationally renowned um, PA educator, Dr. James Cawley. In addition, you will take clinical assessment. That's an opportunity for you to learn how to conduct, uh, obtain a medical history and perform a physical examination. And this course is very closely aligned with anatomy. Based on your anatomical knowledge, as well as the knowledge and skills that you acquire through clinical assessment, our, our curriculum is even more integrated with practical cases in a course called Integration into Clinical Concepts. In this particular course, you work in small groups which are facilitated by your faculty advisor. What's wonderful about this is that it provides an opportunity for your faculty advisor to see how you are developing professionally and also allows the students to get to know their faculty advisor and hopefully build a bond that will, that will continue for many, many years. The other course that's taken in the summer is Health Justice in Society. This is a two course series um, that takes place in the summer semester as well as the fall semester and the focus of this particular course is patient advocacy and community service. In the fall, you're going to expand your basic science knowledge even more by taking courses in physiology, microbiology, and pathology. Then you'll start the first of the two clinical uh, medicine courses, as well as a human behavior course, in which you look, which cover the uh, psychiatric illnesses and behavioral counseling. And these organ system-based courses approach the pathophysiology, diagnosis, and treatment of many of the um, diseases that you will encounter in clinical practice. You will also be engaged in a course um, in pharmacology, which parallels the topics that are being covered in clinical medicine, so that you can learn about the appropriate pharmacologic approaches to disease management. In addition, you will take clinical skills this is a two-part, uh, two-course two series. This, you'll take part one in the fall, and the emphasis in clinical skills one is to teach you how to interpret EKGs and radiologic um, studies. Mm -hmm. okay. Finally, in the spring, you'll complete the final clinical medicine course and take part two of pharmacology and pathology. In addition, you'll take clinical skills too, and this is an opportunity for you to get the hands-on experiences where you're exposed to the technical procedures 
that PAs will, uh, will be required to know how to perform both in their clinical year of the program as well as when they practice um, clinically after graduation. In addition, you will take um, a, the second iteration of the evidence-based practice course. However, in this version, it's not more necessarily theory-based, but it has more to do with um, applying the existing research into everyday clinical practice. And the integration into clinical concept course continues for the final semester. <clears throat> Beginning in the summer of the second year, students begin the clinical curriculum. This is when you have an opportunity to take all the knowledge and skills that you gained in your didactic year of training and apply it to patients on an everyday basis. During your clinical year, you will, take, you will be involved in eight clinical rotations, including an elective in uh, a medical or surgical specialty or subspecialty. And all of our rotations are six weeks in length. The rotations are located in diverse clinical settings, including inpatient and outpatient um, settings, as well as urban, rural, and suburban settings as well. The MSHS MPH dual degree um, gives you the skills not only to practice medicine, but it also provides a broader, a broader context of population health. Currently, the MPH program at GW allows, allows you to choose from several tracks of study. And while the default um, track is community-oriented primary care, there are other tracks that you can choose from, including health promotion and disease prevention, global health, maternal and child health, health policy, epidemiology, and environmental science. I recommend if you're interested in learning more about these tracks, that you um, visit the Milton Institute School of Public Health website for more information. Presently, the PA MPH includes the same PA, per, PA curriculum that I talked about earlier with the MSHS program, but it's interdigitated with the 45 credit public health curriculum. So mainly in the first year, your main focus is on your public health courses, and you will take some basic science courses. Presently, students are taking um, biochemistry and physiology. During the second year, you're finishing up your public health courses and there's a greater focus on your PA didactic courses. And then your third year, is your focus is primarily on your clinical rotation. And I'm now going to open up the floor to Ms. McCann, who will talk to you about the application process. Thank you, Dr. Ray. Um, so we have a couple of admissions requirements to get into the GWPA, the GW Physician Assistant Program. The first is you have to have a bachelor's degree from a regionally accredited institution. Now, if you are an international student and you have a degree from an international institution, that's fine, but you will need to have it reviewed by one of our accrediting agencies. You can look online for many of the accreditation agencies that we have on our website. You must have an undergraduate cumulative GPA of uh, 3.0 and an overall science GPA of 3.0 as well. So if you add up all of your science courses that you took in your undergrad and that you took in your post bac courses, it has to be at least a 3.0. Um, you also must submit a GRE score within the last five years. Um, so if you're looking at your GRE, you took it in 2008. Unfortunately, you'll have to retake the GRE to submit those courses. Our prerequisite courses we'll talk a little bit more about. And then, of course, you need your rec patient care experience. And we'll also talk a little bit more about that as well. So the prerequisites. We require that you have six specific courses. These courses are two biological sciences. Um, these can be any college-level biology courses. So you can take biology, you can take genetics, you can take microbiology. But we actually strongly recommend that you take anatomy and physiology. The reason is because you will be taking two, one of those courses, or even two of those courses, once you get to your campus. So it's best to have that kind of background information. We also require two chemistry courses. One of those chemistry courses must be organic or biochemistry. Um, and then finally, we, have, we require two psychology courses. Again, one must be introduction or general psychology. Again, we also suggest that you take abnormal psychology, but it's not required. Um, you must receive a B minus or better in these courses, and they must be taken from a regionally accredited institution. 
There's a couple things to remember about your prerequisites. You cannot have them from outside of the United States. They must be taken within the United States. And they must be taken as part of either undergraduate or post -bank. So let's say you took these, you got a master's degree in biology, you would not be able to use your master's degree for those prerequisite courses. Okay. You are allowed to submit, you're allowed to apply to the program with at least four of the six courses. So if you have the biology and the chemistry courses, but you still need the psychology, you can still apply. But you must be completed, you must complete those two psychology courses by the time you are enrolled in the college, which is usually about April 30th when you get a finally admitted. Okay. All right, prior health care experience. That's a big one for a lot of students. We require 1,000 hours of direct patient care experience. We are very, very stuck on 1,000 hours. So if you have one, let's say you have 999, you want to make sure that you have 1,000 before you apply. We will not review any applications that don't have 1,000 hours. And as I said, all hours must be completed by the time of your submission, and that application is submitted. So you want to make sure that once you submit, you have the hours, and not that, oh, well, I'm going to have some hours by the time I get to GW. It's not quite the case. You must have 1,000 hours. We consider direct patient care experience um, as experience that you are taking, you're working with patients in a medical setting, and you're working hands-on with patients. You're taking the vitals, you're taking medical history. It can be such as medical scribe, it can be EMT paramedic. I mean, what was your um, direct patient care experience? Do you remember? I was a medical assistant for orthopedic practice. Okay. Dan? I was a combat lifesaver in the Marines and in EMT. So there you go. <laughs> Those are definitely two options that you could do. Um, and we kind of leave it up to you. If you ever have any questions about what direct patient care experience could be, please feel free to send us an email. We also ask that you have at least six months of health-related experience. That would be experience such as working at a dentist's office or maybe working in the front office or working as a medical transporter where you're moving patients from one place to the next. We also require that you have GRE scores and they must be due by October 1st, our deadline. So you must send an official copy to GW either by mail or electronically through ETS. Our code is 5246. I will tell you there is no secondary code, and there may not be a code for CAFSA, so the important thing to do is that when you're taking your GRE scores, send them right through ETS or email them straight to us. So scores for this year must be from 2010 to 2014. So the application, um, there are three parts that you have to have for your application to be complete. Uh, the CAFSA application your GW supplemental application, and then your GRE score. And each part of that has to be completed. So for your tax application, you want to submit all of your transcripts, three to two, three, two to three letters of recommendation, and then you want to have your GRE score. If you haven't looked at CASPA, it's very important to look at it pretty quickly, especially if you're thinking about applying for this uh, round, because the CASPA, CASPA application requires you to put in every transcript and every class that you've ever taken. And that can be a bit of a burden. And it can take a very long time from you putting in your stuff to us actually getting your application. You also want to make sure that you do our GW supplemental application. We do not send it to students. It's on our website. And that gives us a little bit more idea of who you are and why you want to be at GW. Uh, the GW supplemental application does ask for a statement of purpose. And the question that we ask is, why is GW the right fit for you? Why is GW the correct PA school for you? Everything must be completed and received by October 1st. And that's really important because, as I said, you can submit your CAFSA application on September 30th, but if we don't receive it until October, I'm sorry, September 30th, but if we don't receive it until October 13th, then you're past the deadline. So it's really important to make sure that all of your materials are in, are submitted to CAFSA way before the deadline. The admissions process. The first process is, part of the process, is verification of prerequisites. So what will happen is your application comes through, I receive it, I make sure you have all the prerequisites, you have a B minus or better, you're taken at a regionally accredited institution, you have your GRE scores, you have um, the GPA of 3.0 or above, and then from there, your application is, at, once it passes all of that, 
your application is sent on to an independent committee for review. Now your application is going to be reviewed maybe two or even three times and it's by our admissions committee which is full of, which is all faculty members. And they're going to review your application to see what you really have and what kind of student you are and what would you be a good fit to bring in for our interview. And the third step is the invitation to interview. Now I'll talk a little bit more about that but our interviews happen in the fall and we have four of them that happen in the fall. Once a student has come in and let's say they get an interview, um, once the interviews are done, they're put back into the pool until the end when we have a chance to really review all the students. If you don't meet the minimum requirements, your application can be denied at that point. So it's really kind of, people say it's like a rolling admissions and it's similar to that, but just keep in mind that not every student will get a decision within a month or two months of them putting in their application. Okay, so interviews. Interviews are in the fall from September to December. They're on Saturdays from 7.30 to 3.30. Um, there are many multiple interviews. And I will say if you don't know what MMI is, it's a good idea to kind of look it up online. Um, these interviews, it's, they're, very, they're, very, they're interesting. It's not like a traditional interview where you come in, sit down, and talk about yourself for 30 minutes. The MMI interviews, you will get one minute to read a prompt and then seven minutes to talk about that prompt, and then another minute to move to the next station. Um, so they run pretty quickly. You also get a chance to have two panel discussions, one from the first year students, and then one from second year students. So not only will you know about what students are doing in their didactic, but you'll also understand what's going on for students that are right in the middle of their rotations right now. And then you'll also get a campus tour as well. So you'll be able to see the campus and see how students are at, what rooms they go to, where do they stay. Um, it's a really good opportunity to see around, uh, see the GW campus. Okay. So I get questions a lot about what makes a competitive applicant. We're going to look at the 2016-2017 student profile. As you can see, our ages range from around, on average, 25 to 27. That does not mean, I want to remind everyone, that these are averages. So it doesn't mean that everyone that's in this room, everyone that's in this class is 27 or 25. It can range anywhere from 21 to 62, you know? Uh, the science GPAs range around 3.5, and our overall GPAs range the same around 3.58 as well. The science credits mean on, for the MSHS students that they've taken about 65 hours of science credits. So you really want to make sure you're looking at yourself and comparing the average yourself to the average student that comes into GW. Our verbal percentile is about 81% and our GRE quant is about 60%. The reason why we use percentiles is because the GRE has kind of switched their way of um, scoring and so some scores are on an 800 scale and some scores are not and so instead we just use percentiles so everyone can work on the same um, score. Okay. So what makes a competitive applicant? Well, it's important to remember, like I said, that all of these are averages. Some of the admitted students will have a 4.0 GPA and they'll have a minimum health care experience. Some students will have 10,000 hours of direct patient care experience and have maybe the minimum 3.0 GPA. It's really important to make sure that you're a well-rounded student and you have everything. You have leadership, you have community service, you have direct patient care experience, the GPA, the GRA. You just want to make sure that you have everything. And that's going to make you a really competitive student. Okay? Just remember that one, no one area outweighs the other. So you want to make sure that when you're putting your application, you're putting in everything. Another point I will say is that when you're sending your CAS application, it should be the most perfect application you've ever sent in because CAPTA will not allow you to change it. So you make sure you've edited it, you've looked over it two or three times to make sure it's the most perfect application you can put in. Okay. So we thank you for listening to us. Um, we're going to now entertain questions. Uh, we have listed some websites that in case you wanted to kind of look into, we have the uh, PA program website, AAPA, PAEA, I'm sure you want to say some of, some of these are. Uh, American Academy of Physician Assistants, the Physician Assistant Education Association, the National Commission on Certification for Physician Assistants, and the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Okay. So, we're going to welcome it, open it up for questions. You can all use your chat to send those questions. You can direct them at either me, Dr. Wright, or either of our students. Does anyone have any questions? You can go, keep off, you can go ahead and just type it out. There we go. Um, so, oh, I'm sorry.
Here we go. All right, first question. Uh, Kristen would like to know, are there any scholarships available for PA students? Um, we do offer some scholarships. Um, they're very limited and uh, usually based on merit and, and some based on need. Um, and yes, yeah, so we do offer some to students, uh, incoming students yeah. to come to the program. Scholarships are very limited, um, so I would not count on making sure you get it. You're saying it's, I wouldn't count on getting a scholarship necessarily because they are very limited and very, very competitive. Um, we do have options of, um, we do have uh, financial aid, which comes in the form of loans, and you're welcome to go to the financial aid website to kind of look over some of the options for that. Okay. Our next question is from, I think it's Ms. Voss. Um, science credits include planned and in progress, and is it the same as the cap for science hours, which I don't think includes math or computer science. Okay, this is a great question. So science hours on CASPA does not include math or computer science. And what they are, science hours really are biology, physics, chemistry, and they also include something called other science, which can include some things like nursing classes um, and other things like that. The best thing you can do is go online to CASPA and they actually tell you what classes they include in their science credits. Okay, I hope that answers your question. If not, you're welcome to right back in. Amy Gomez wants to know, can you do your clinical rotations locally or can you leave the area? Yes, you have an opportunity to do rotations locally or outside of the um, um, district. Um, the only stipulation that we have is that there has to be an affiliation agreement in place and you have to be in good academic standing. Does anyone else have any questions? Dr. Ray, uh, what are the opportunities for veteran applicants in regards to admissions consideration? Um, well, we, we take that into consideration with regard to match to mission. So a veteran is a very, uh, is an ideal candidate. Um, I don't know if you want to add anything else to that, Mr. Brown? Um, James, I'm also a veteran. Um, we have a significant amount uh, in the, the the current class is in the didactic year right now. I believe there's 11, mm -hmm. and I believe that's more than any we've had yeah. before. So um, uh, the trend is going up, and uh, if, uh, if you're worried about finance or anything like that, the GI Bill and the Yellow Ribbon Program are covering my tuition 100% completely. So it's a great deal to, to come here. Thank you, James. Is there any other questions? No problem. <laughs> so the question Amy has is regarding healthcare experience. Can medical or pharmaceutical sales be considered? No, that is not direct to patient care. Right. The reason why really is because you have like I said, you have to be working with patients. Not necessarily the doctors, you have to be working with patients. Um, you know, she could, she's saying that it could be that she's actually selling the equipment directly to patients, but that's not considered right. mm -hmm. direct patients. Right. It was still, you still have to be doing something in a, in a, almost in a medical setting. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is, oh. Okay. Um, it's got to be hands-on. Yeah. Amy, it has to really be hands-on. I mean, you really want to be doing something like, like I said, taking medical history, taking uh, vitals. Uh, something like, is it phlebotomy? I always said that incorrectly. Phlebotomy, where you're um, taking blood, it really has to be more hands on with the patient specifically. Okay. If you are ready for a pharmaceutical sales or your medical sales, that's fine. What you want to start doing at this point is looking into something that does give you a little bit more hands on opportunity. So, we all, I always tell students to start looking into volunteer options. Um, it might take a while. We, what, we're not going to say that this is an easy thing to undertake. It might take a while to create a connection and become like a medical assistant or a, um, a nurse's aide. It might take a while to make that connection and do the time that you need to get the thousand hours. But that's going to prepare you so when you come in and you already have that background knowledge working as a PA. What um, route did you use uh, for me to become a medical assistant? 
I was actually working in the practice as in a bunch of different positions, and um, I had always shown interest in wanting to have direct patient care. And so the nice thing about the office I worked in was that they trained the the employees who wanted to do medical assistance on site, and they had to go through that process in the office. So it was nice that I started at a, as a receptionist, did the bookkeeping for the office, and then ended up, because I showed interest, uh, doing the medical assistant position. So you might be able to find with your pharmaceutical or medical sales position the contacts that you've made with different medical offices. You might be able to inquire about if they have positions opening that you might be able to step into because you've already had that point of contact. Okay. Um, Kristen wants to know, would medical service trips that are outside of the United States be considered clinical hours? Um, yes, we do consider international hours. We, it does not have to be within the United States. It can be uh, when you go away and do a service trip, um, as long, again, but it still has to, you can't, so in other words, if you did a service trip in Guatemala where you're building a hospital or helping to build a part of a hospital, you, that's just building. It has to be working with patients. Okay? Okay. You're welcome, Amy. Um, if you're welcome, you don't have to raise your hand. You can just go ahead and type in a question and we'll make sure we catch all the questions uh, that people write down. Okay. So for these specific questions about direct patient care, um, I would say um, to email us because the problem with this setup here is that we don't know what your actual duties are as a nuclear med tech. Um, so some students as a nuclear med tech are just working in the lab. Um, other students would uh, be working with patients. So you want to make sure that if it's something specific to a, a position that you have right now, go ahead and send us an email, and I can type out my email for everyone. Um, and that way we can kind of sit down, you can say what your duties are, and then we can decide if it's direct patient care. All right. James says, no problem. Okay, so James wants to know, is there any part of the application process that will automatically disqualify you um, from getting your app read to the admissions committee? Yes, there are. If you do not have the 3.0 GPA, if you have a 2.9, if you have, even if you have a 2.99, that will disqualify you. If you do not complete, if you have more than two outstanding prerequisites, that will also disqualify you. If you do not have a thousand hours of direct patient care experience, that also will disqualify you. If you do not complete a supplemental, that will disqualify you. If you do not send in your GRE scores, that will disqualify you. So it's not necessarily, those are requirements. If you do not meet our requirements, unfortunately those will disqualify you from moving on to the application process. Um, but if you have a lower GRE score, that in no way will stop you from moving on to the next uh, part. And it will no way stop you from moving on to the admissions committee. Um, as I said before, those are averages. You know, our GRE percentiles are averages. Do we have students that have come in with maybe a 40 percentile GRE? Yes. You know, so it really just depends on what you have else in your background to kind of um, consider or bring in everything. Even though you have your own, maybe a lower GRE score. We'll look at you holistically to right. see, because um, it could be that you have a very strong um, healthcare background, that you perform very well in your science courses and things of that nature. Um, so we take all that into consideration. Yes, it will be possible to get a recorded version of this webinar. It will be on the, web, the GW website, the same place that you logged in to um, reserve a spot for this webinar. will be the same place where you can find a recorded version. We probably won't be able to get it up until Tuesday because of the holiday. You're all welcome. <laughs> Is there any other questions? Okay. So 
So Chris, I'd like to know how many applications did you receive last year, and of, of those, how many were offered interviews and then ultimately accepted? Okay. We received over 1,400 applications last year. We uh, offered 240 interviews, um, and we now have a class of 68. So it's competitive. You're, you're welcome. <laughs> Did anyone have any questions for us? Oh, how many PAs versus MPH students? Um, so it's about. Well, the current class, um, the, the class is going to graduate in 2016. There are 13 MPH yes. students and the rest, uh, 55 MSHS um, students, and the class. That's going to graduate in 2017. We accepted 15 MPH mm -hmm. students. Um, as far as for clinical clinical rotations, ambulatory care medicine. Um, can I can we elaborate on that? That's more like out uh, like a, in an outpatient care setting. Um, it could be that you're working in a family practice office or you're working in a um, some type of outpatient clinic. Um, could be sometimes it's even like an urgent care clinic, uh, but it's definitely not in an inpatient setting. Um, how are students matched with a wait? How are students matched with a faculty advisor? So <laughs> I've done that now for the past two years. I've matched the students with their um, faculty advisors. I take everything into consideration. I want to make sure that there's a good balance of uh, MSHS and MPAM uh, dual, dual students. I look at your health background because I want to make sure that, you're, that the um, group is composed of students from with uh, varying um, health care backgrounds. Mm -hmm. um, I take things into consideration like age. I just try to make sure that it's a well-rounded group. And I've, I've been told by the faculty that at least for the last two years I've Great. done a pretty good job. <laughs> I'm you could ask the students. Can you guys tell me about your faculty advisors? Yeah, I um, I really enjoy the integration setting because you get to, like Dr. Wright said, mm -hmm. is that you have other students that are in your setting that have a lot to offer and things that I didn't experience or things that I didn't know about. And our, my faculty advisor is Professor Strauss, and it's excellent to have that dynamic. You have the students asking questions and then the professor being able to give you real world examples on how to solve problems. And I found it to be very helpful. Uh, what do you think, Dan? <laughs> <laughs> um, I kind of enjoyed the, the breadth and depth of experience that was um, within my integration group. Uh, I have Professor Dunphy as my uh, advisor, and she's uh, reached out uh, to all of us in our group and, uh, and just talks about uh, how we're doing the program as well and makes sure that there, there's a link between the faculty and the students. And they're really interested in making sure that uh, we're all going to get through and, and do well. So it's a great, a great experience integration and uh, with our faculty advisor. And it all kind of pans out. How many integration students are in your group? We have six. So. Yeah, six. Okay. So it's a small, it's very, it's, yeah, it's a, more, it's a small group of students. Okay. Are there any other questions? No. No, he does. Uh, we have we have a few that have uh, that have. Oh. Okay, we have we have a few students um, that are uh, married and are, have families and are, are doing pretty well um, with balancing um, young kids and older kids and uh, and schoolwork. So uh, it's it's tough, but it's definitely possible. And we're actually working on this year creating a program that will allow the spouses of, um, of our current students to kind of come together and create almost like a support group um, for each other so they know each other, they know what's going on. Um, it'll just help out students that have significant others. Um, students uh, that have families, 
it, it can be a major adjustment, especially depending on how how young they are. I know that I've had an, um, an advisee that had a, a young infant when she, um, well, toddler when she entered the program, and it, it, it took it was a balancing act, and we had to come up with be uh, come up with different strategies about what worked best for her with regard to spending some time with her family and then having that dedicated time to study. I find in many cases that uh, students that have families actually are pretty good at time management. Mm -hmm. And so they, how to use, they know how to use their time well. And so you definitely can thrive. It's just going to be a matter of trying to find that right balance um, so that you can dedicate time. Because it's a very rigorous program. There's no doubt. I think the students will tell you, they, uh, although they've only completed one semester, it is a very rigorous program. But it's definitely doable. And I, I do believe that students with um, young children can, can, um, can um, uh, prosper just as well as um, students without uh, children. You'll find time management skills immediately. Um, it's, it's kind of one of those things where you have to do it in order to survive. And also the classmates, uh, when we do things outside of the classroom, we also invite families over. So that helps in terms of creating your little group of people that will support you. So it's a nice environment. And that leads into our next question, which is, even though it's a two-year program, are students involved in other student and our university groups? So do students have, and the other question is, do students have time outside of classwork and clinical rotation? So really, how would you guys life outside of GW? Or within GW? Dan, do you want to go first? Um, I try to keep Saturdays holy, um, so I don't like to touch a book or anything like that. Not because I'm I'm married and I like to give my wife attention as well. Um, so um, we'll usually go out and do something, um, but usually Sundays are usually there for for prep for the week. Um, but uh, usually you gotta have one day where it's just it's it's off. You just turn off the switch. Um, but uh, outside of class, um, there's plenty of stuff to do in DC. Um, I've been to a couple of Nats games. Um, there's a, I mean, there's no shortage of uh, museums to, to see and do, and there's a lot of great restaurants and stuff. So it's, it's a great place for for family. It's just going to take you time to to make the adjustments because some people don't need a lot of time um, dedicated to their studies. Others struggle, and they it, it can sometimes be very frustrating because they need a lot of time to try to prepare for exams, where somebody else, depending on their their study techniques. Um, it doesn't take them very much time to master the material. So I do believe that it's very important for you to have um, time dedicated to do things outside of the program. But it, I, I, again, I reiterate, this is a very rigorous program, and a lot of time will be dedicated to studying and preparing for your class. Okay. Um, so do students have time outside of classwork and clinical rotation? So we kind of talked a little bit about that, they do. For clinical rotation specifically, it's really more about your schedule. So even though we set you up with the rotation, once you get there to that hospital, we don't set you up with your schedule. So that schedule is up to you and whoever your supervisor is at that hospital or at that um, care provider. So you may be working weekends, you may be not working weekends, you may be working weekends. It's really up to you and we're really up to your supervisor and how you guys work out your schedule. So it's really dependent on what rotation you get and where your rotation is and things like that. It may vary. You may have a surgery rotation where they, you are there 60 hours per week and then you follow up with perhaps maybe a family practice or some type of um, ambulatory clinic. Where you're just where you just putting in 40 hours a week, so it, it, over over the course of the year, it's kind of balanced, but it will vary from rotation to rotation and setting. Okay, so another question is, have we noticed older students or younger students tend to struggle more over the year? I haven't found. I don't think it's more of an age thing. I just think it's more of a person thing. It depends on how the person deals with it. Um, if a person has already has already their study skills and like we said before, time management skills, that plays a huge part rather than a student coming in who does not have those skills at all. So it really just matters the background of the student. Um, you can have older students and younger students that have that time management background and will come in and just, you know, it will still be difficult, but they can work through it. And then you'll have students that come in that have, aren't used to this type of uh, rigor and it gets a little bit tougher for them. One thing that's really important about uh, GW is that you take a test 
in terms of how you best um, learn. So they tell you coming in what type of a learner you are, if you're visual, you're auditory, you're kinesthetic. Um, and that helps because for those students that may not have already created those time management skills, then you can hone in on how you best can grasp the material so you can make your time more effective. So it, it is rigorous, but it's something that uh, with time and perseverance you can definitely do and achieve, and it's something that is a positive challenge instead of something to look at as something that you can't do, per se. Celine is referring to the VARC. So if you, if you want to Google VARC, and uh, it will ask you a series of questions about how you um, deal with certain situations, it will, it will be able to determine what type of learner you are. Unfortunately for me, I'm a read-write, so I have to read everything and write everything. <laughs> and so that's very time consuming, so that means I have to manage my time really, really well. I'm very auditory and I also have to write. Um, so there's a great program here at the, the school where all the uh, lectures are actually recorded and synced up with PowerPoint presentations. So you can go back through them and listen. And I'll take notes over and over and over again until it sinks in. But, uh, and you can adjust the speed on, the, on, the, on it so that you can take some time and go, get a little more efficient. It's a great learning tool. So the next question is, how does the PA program work for international students in terms of the acceptance rate into the program are able to go through it successfully? Um, we actually have an international student in our class, our Dardessa class right now. Um, she is from Korea. Um, she really is a matter of what you can be as an stu international student in the PA program. We're not stopping any international students from applying. We actually encourage it. Um, the important thing to keep in mind is citizenship. Um, and you're, if you have a visa, if you have a work visa or a um, school visa, it really depends. That's more specific. Um, but I would say for acceptance rate, it, it just depends on how many students apply uh, and how many students uh, go through the process and have all the prerequisites uh, ready to go. Um, but if you have all of that and you are you pretty much are kind of, we look at you in the sense of you do bring some type of, of some diversity to our uh, group, which is fantastic. Um, but overall, it's, a, it's another student. We will help you try and get you for visas, and we know the process can be very daunting, and I helped out that one student that we had bit by bit and step by step, but um, we look at it as almost every other student. So. The question James is asking is, do most students find jobs before graduation? <clears throat> um, I would say that when you're on your clinical rotations, that's an opportunity. <laughs> that's for your preceptor to see you working. They're looking at your work ethic, they're looking at your interests, they're looking at your clinical skills. We have many students that will tell us that, the pre that their preceptor wants to hire them after they uh, sit for the um, uh, boards and successfully pass them. So you can find a job before you graduate. Just remember that you have to also pass the boards and, um, um, and, and you will get employed. Uh, the employment rate is, is very high. It doesn't take long for you to find a job. Our, our, our um, graduates are highly regarded, mm -hmm. and um, I think if, if you had an opportunity, if we had alumni here, you would realize that um, they, they, they do not find it very, very di difficult to find jobs after they leave the program. I will also say that um, not a day goes by that we don't get a request for a GWPA. You know, oh, we have an opening in our um, in our surgery department. Do you have any GWPAs that might be interested in Texas? Or do you have any GWPAs that are in Vermont? We get them every day. And not only do we get them, but we then send them out to our students. So we have the serve that you stay on as an alumni. And let's say you want to change your jobs. You're going to get maybe two or three requests for GWPAs. So we're, they're definitely in high, high demand. My right, question is, what are some of the most imperative yearly PA meetings to attend each year? Uh, oh, do you mean, Amy, I'm sorry, do you mean like conferences? Yeah, okay, great. Um, I don't, do you guys have any conferences? Okay, at that time. 
Yeah, I haven't been able to go to the conferences, but um, GW is really good about working with students and um, fundraising to get students to go. And they make time in the schedule in terms of the didactic and the clinical year to allow time. Um, Unfortunately, last year I wasn't able to go, but um, the students that did go this year had a fantastic time Boston. in Boston. They were there presenting about what we did as a student body at the Tolton Society, and then also the representing the program and interacting with other students and TAs that are working in the field. So it was something that people really like to do, and you can definitely get the support that you might need to get there. So what are those organizations? The CAA? Oh, um, That's usually so the AAPA, American the, Academy of Physicians. Yeah, that happens annually in May. Um, Memorial Day? You, it's right before Memorial Day. Right, around that yeah. right around Memorial Day. And if you want to learn more about it, you could go to the AAPA website. And um, hopefully we'll have a Tolton Society website soon so that future students can look at it and find out more about getting involved with those types of activities and um, being able to go to the conference and see what that's actually like. So hopefully that will be coming soon to, so that you can access that. Um, next question is, is preference given to students who live in D.C. area in regards to admission? No. That's a very easy answer. No. <laughs> we, have, we were literally just talking about how we have a, a very a very amount of students from different parts of this country. Um, I don't even know, sometimes we do have students from D.C., Maryland, and Virginia, sometimes we don't. It really just depends on who gets in that year. Um, where are you from? I'm from Oregon, right near Portland, it's a suburb of Portland, and Dan is from... I'm originally from Manassas, Virginia, but I applied when I was in North Carolina. And um, just go, I did a survey recently as, um, as part of our admissions uh, presentation of where everyone's from, and it's kind of an even spread across all the regions of the country. Does anyone have any other questions? <coughs> oh, oh, big one. Uh, for the international student, it's, um, even though you're getting your undergrad degree from the state, it doesn't necessarily give you an advantage, and it doesn't necessarily give you any aid in getting accepted. Um, because when students get their degree from other countries, um, what we do is we get them to review them by usually an accrediting agency, and that accrediting agency will review your with your transcript, and they pretty much correlate it to what it would be if it was a uh, state. Um, a United States transcript uh, or American transcript. So it, it doesn't really give you any advantage or disadvantage. I will say if you are a U.S. citizen, it does give you an advantage for financial aid because U.S. citizens do have the opportunity to get um, federal aid, whereas students that are not um, international students, unfortunately, do not get that opportunity to get the federal aid. No problem. Thank you. So we'll just wrap up. We have we have plenty of time, but if anyone has any other final questions. Oh. So really the question is, is there a hands-on experience that is more favorable or less favorable? I will leave it up to our faculty member. No, we're, we're looking at the quality of the experience and the number of hours that you've done. So if you actually were volunteering and you have over 5,000 hours of, of um, direct patient care and somebody else was maybe an LPN or an RN but only has 1,000 hours, it, it kind of balances itself out. The important thing is that we're looking for direct patient care because we're looking to see if the students are going to demonstrate that they're going to have a hard time um, practicing in the clinical setting. And that's why most PA programs are looking for students to do direct patient care. So we get this question all the time if, you know, one um, uh, rated more higher than 
more highly than the other, and it, and, it, and it truly is a balancing act. It could be that you um, were a uh, an RN for and have over 5,000 hours, like right. great. And so that person's um, direct patient care may be stronger than somebody else that may have just volunteered with, or with and they just barely got 1,000 hours. But the, the important thing to take away here is to make sure that you get the direct patient care because the other things are going to help. You may, you may be lacking in the direct patient care. I mean, as long as you met the criteria, so then we're looking at the other areas. You know, how strong is your science GPA? How, um, you know, what are your leadership skills? Have you demonstrated leadership? What is your community service? Our, our, our mission and, and vision is very much centered around community service. And so if you've done, like, you know, hundreds of hours in community service, they start to weigh each other out. So we look at you holistically. We look at, at you, you know, based on all aspects. So yes, there is a minimum GPA that as soon as you have, um, it is 3.0. Um, and the question is, is the higher the GPA, the better? Not necessarily. I mean, you can have a student that only took six science courses and got a 4.0 in those six science courses. That's great, but you only took six science courses, and that's just not enough, you know? So it really, you really have to make sure that you're looking at the whole package. Um, so, like I said, there are students that have maybe the minimum GPA with 3.0 and have, you know, tons of hours or community service and have this. And then there might be students that have uh, a 4.0, but then, you know, they might have um, less hours. So it, it really just depends, um, but we are looking for students that are strong academically and strong in experience and volunteer. We're looking for a very strong student. And the reason why we're really stressing this is because you have to be a strong student because once you get here, it's a tough program. And we want you to succeed and we want you to already have the skills so that when you get here, you can succeed. No problem. Thank you guys so much. Oh, one more question. Um, the current students, what led you to choose? Oh no, it's fine. It's fine, Kristen. What led you to choose to attend GW rather than any other programs you may have been admitted to? That's a great question. You go first. <laughs> so I, I, I applied to a lot of programs, and I, I would highly encourage you to apply to GW. Um, it's it's a fantastic program. Uh, the interviews that I went on. GW really spoke to me. The MMIs, I really enjoyed that. Of all the different formats of the interviews that I've had at other places, written interviews, group interviews, things that, like that, the MMI, I felt, gave me a really fair chance. It was 10 people that were able to get a first impression of me instead of one person in one room or by writing something in on a table, you know, for 30 minutes with a with a question. So I really liked the interview format, and I really felt comfortable when it came to the campus and discussed with students and faculty on interview day. And then the mission was very important to me in terms of commitment to your community and diversity and the excellence of education. I've I really enjoyed my time here, and um, I, I guess the thing that I would stress to you is that through your interview process, you're going to find the program that speaks to you and fits you as an individual, and I just would encourage you to try and not limit yourself. I, uh, I applied to nine different programs, and um, I got to say, and I did not get an interview for all of them, but um, I would say that of the interviews I did get, this was my um, best experience. Um, I really enjoyed uh, the, the NMI. I really enjoyed uh, the campus and all the facilities that are here that are all in the city. Um, uh, just the, the district itself is a great place to be. Uh, the faculty are outstanding. The students that you're going to run into are outstanding. It's a really great uh, it's just a really great experience and a great time uh, to be here. So I really think that, you know, um, absolutely go and, and seek out of the programs and uh, weigh them against uh, what, what you have here and uh, make a, a, a choice as to what, what fits you uh, the best. Thank you, Dan. Because we're, when, we, when you come to interview with us, we're looking to see if you're going to be a, a, a good fit for us. And you should be doing the same. When you come, we're, we're, we're being um, 
looked at to see if if we are a good fit for you. So you have to take that into consideration. So if you do are fortunate enough to be offered an interview and you and you come, you need to take that into consideration when you come. If you don't feel comfortable, you don't like the way the classes are, um, the curriculum is, is set up. We, you know, some people do better in, uh, in, in a certain type of curriculum over others. You have to take all that into consideration. Any other questions? You're welcome. I think we'll take we'll take final questions. If anyone has any other questions? Okay. I think that's it then. Oh. Oh. Are there after hour access to facilities and labs? Yes. Right? Fred? Yes. The, the the clinical assessment lab is uh, you can schedule it on your own. And uh, go in there with a partner and uh, practice for your head to toe exam, which we, uh, Celine is actually my head to toe partner. Uh, oh, really? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> uh, for, uh, for our actual uh, assessment there. And it's, uh, you need to do that and, um, and, and go over it a lot uh, with, with someone else. So uh, it's good to, to practice okay. and have that facility there available. Mm -hmm. I did not know that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you, Jean. Um, so, as I said before, we really appreciate you all listening in. Um, this will be posted probably sometime next week on our website if you want to review it or have any other questions. Um, it will also, at the end of uh, the presentation, have my name and my email address if you have any further personal admissions questions that you wanted to go through. Um, at this time, I don't take one-on-one -on -one sessions, so please feel free to give me a call or send me an email. I will always try and get back to you within 24 hours. So thank you so much. We really appreciate you being a part of our webinar. Um, and have a great night. Thank you. Thank you.